Hi, my name's Shawnee Davis and welcome to Tycoon Talk. This week I'm in the tropical island of Guam to meet Henry Tan, CEO of Luntai Holdings, Hong Kong's largest garment manufacturer as well as the largest conglomerate here on the island. Hong Kong is one of the wealthiest cities on the planet. I'm on a journey to meet the most successful business leaders who can inspire a new generation of entrepreneurs to help our city remain truly world class. I also want to get behind the public persona and find out their secrets for extreme success. At first glance, Henry Tan would appear to be your archetypal Hong Kong business leader. He is CEO of Luntai Holdings, producing garments and accessories for some of the world's leading brands. But Henry's rise to the top is not your average Hong Kong story. In fact, Henry's career didn't begin in Hong Kong at all. So I'm off to the airport to fly to Guam. And you might be asking, why Guam? Well, Henry's story really begins in Guam because that's where he went to university and where he started doing business. He also met his wife there. The Tan family moved to the island when Henry was just a young man. Today, in addition to the apparel business in Hong Kong, Henry is head of a conglomerate with interests in shipping, transportation, fishing, and hotels across Guam and Micronesia. On arrival in Guam, I catch up with Henry at one of his hotels, the Fiesta Resort, overlooking the white sands and reefs of Tumon Bay. Tell us a little bit about how you got started here. Back in 1972, when I just finished high school, I mean, my dad asked me to come to Guam as he was running some shipping business here. They should come in every two weeks, so I'm asked to go to the commercial port every other week just to figure out what's going on. and. Uh, a year and a half later, the ship is no longer coming. I try to figure out what to do and while I'm going to college here. At that time, the Bruce Lee picture became very popular. And then, uh, so I asked my dad, maybe, you know, we can do some film distribution. He sent me a picture that we play in the movie theater. And the owner promised to me to play it. After playing for a week, he gave me $7,000 for uh, the film and I split 50-50 with the producer in Hong Kong. So as a student, I make 3,500 US dollars a week. That's a lot of money. 3,500 US dollars a week? Yeah. In the 70s? Yeah, in the 70s, early 70s. So you, you had a pretty good knack for making some money even as a student? Mm, yeah, and then I, I tried to ask for more pictures. So I go back to Hong Kong, I actually my father helped to set up a company in Hong Kong to buy films. At its peak, you know, we have over 2,000 films. I've got a lot of friends, classmates in, in the school from the islands. So we go to Saipan and Palau and go to the Marshall Island, the entire Micronesia. So in the 70s, I practically go to every single island in the Pacific, then an airplane would land. Henry's father, Tan Siu Lin, founded the company in the 1960s as a shipping and trading group. The family left Hong Kong and settled in Guam in 1973, when Henry was just 19. Henry entered the University of Guam that same year. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in business administration in 1975, followed later by an MBA. In 1979, the company acquired the Century Plaza shopping mall in Guam. This was the start of a major expansion in Guam and Saipan. They then went into garment manufacturing, opening their first factory in Saipan in 1983, allowing them to benefit from zero tariffs on exports to the US. The garment business expanded rapidly and opened factories in China. Luntai Holdings was publicly listed in 2004 and Henry became CEO. In 2013, Henry was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Guam for his services to the island. Today, the apparel group employs 44,000 workers in factories across Asia and generates over 1.2 billion US dollars in annual revenues. What are the challenges of manufacturing in China today? Are you moving more of your factories outside of China or are you planning to keep them in China? It is very true. I mean, Chinese cost, you can't get a worker for $600. Uh, in Southeast Asia, you probably pay $200 to $300. So, not only the wages, the renminbi appreciation, 
and the rest of the fee and costs is added in China. So I think some of the light manufacturing uh, will probably start to migrate to Southeast Asia or elsewhere in the world. And for some of the very fast turnaround things or very complicated orders, which is more suitable to be manufactured in China, and for a product that will be sold in China, I believe that they will still be better to be manufactured in China. Uh, right now, we have a very successful joint venture with Skechers USA to distribute the shoes and eventually garment in China and Southeast Asia. How important is your father when it comes to you doing business? My father gives us very good guidance and we also believe in his core value of doing business. I think he lead the, me and my brothers and the family business to grow it to where it is today. He is still coming to office every day. In fact, he likes to come to office including Saturdays. And uh, he's very hardworking, but it's, it's good that he's, he's being kept busy. Dr. Tan Su Lin left China for the Philippines in 1948, where he worked for his father. In 1961, their business was destroyed in a fire, and the family moved to Sabah, Malaysia, where they ran a rubber plantation and trading business. Dr. Tan moved back to Hong Kong in 1965, where he founded the initial shipping and trading company. He recently celebrated 50 years in business. Today, all six of Dr. Tan's children, of which Henry is the eldest, are involved in the family business. You have quite a complex family governance structure. You have a family council and a family office, and you have regular meetings to discuss decision making. Actually, about 10 years ago, the, all the brother and sister, we sat down together ourselves, and we decided uh, that we should not split the business. While it is easier to split the business than each of us doing our own business, but when you combine all the financial resources, uh, it gives you more strength and also better diversify and better balance as different business could go up and down. So we set up the family office, we hire a family office director, and uh, we set up rules. You need to be transparent to all the family members, what are the benefits given, but you need to set up a standard. So I mean, the family pay for education, pay for health, and some of them um, get together money, go to vacation. But still, you need a structure. How do you incentivize the family to say, come work for the family business rather than go off and potentially earn more as an investment banker? Well, I think uh, we do not force anybody to come in and uh, we just encourage them to join. And basically, we have to pay a competitive uh, market price uh, for the talent. And of course, we also want the best talent from the family member. I mean, we do not want everybody to join. We want to, to find the best that can join and be able to work with my associates to grow the company. Whether you're starting a business with family partners or not, Henry has three top tips for new entrepreneurs, which he freely admits derive from his father's core values. Always be honest in life and your business dealings. Be hardworking. There's no substitute for it and always be ready to seize opportunities. In life, you'll have different opportunities pass you by, and whether you're able to capture those moments and expand on them will be what drives your success. George Chu is Henry's brother-in-law and executive vice president of Tan Holdings, the group which now oversees the many family businesses on Guam and Saipan. I ask him what it's like to work for such a large family business. I think working for the family business actually has a lot more pressure because failure is not an option. If you're working for a non-family business, if you don't like the job, you can just resign. When you're in a family business, you know, resigning is, is, is loss of face, not just loss of face for myself. So that adds a little bit of additional pressure on, on being working for a family, family business. And have you ever failed? Failure is not an option. <laughs> and what are the benefits of working for a family business? Good question. I, I don't know what the benefits are. All I know is there's definitely additional pressure. Because <laughs> well, people kind of think of family businesses as easygoing for those incumbents who come in because, you know, they're part of the family, they're going to be given an easy ride. If you have that type of attitude, that's an unsuccessful family business. Definitely there's a lot more pressure. I wouldn't call it challenges. I would call it more on the family side of the issue. I, it's definitely uh, a lot of fun. There are advantages of uh, being in a family business. 
um, because you have a closer relationship with your bosses, so to speak. But at the same time, like I said, the pressure on failure is really uh, a lot higher because you don't have the option of just saying, oh, I don't, I don't like this job, I just want to find a different one. You've, you've got to find a way to make it work. Describe Henry's management style. Henry expects you to work hard. He works hard. When your boss works super hard, he leads by example, so you have to work even harder. When he asks for something, it's never something that you need to give to him tomorrow. He already expected it yesterday. So you kind of have to be on your toes and be a little bit proactive and anticipate what he wants. In part two, Henry rejoins us, and I discuss with him how he manages to balance the demands of both the businesses in Hong Kong and Guam. I also accompany Henry on a trip down memory lane as we visit his alma mater, the University of Guam. Plus, we get to enjoy some of the scenic beauty of this island, both above the Pacific Ocean and deep beneath it. Welcome back to Tycoon Talk. I'm spending some downtime on the beautiful Pacific island of Guam with Henry Tan. Henry is CEO of one of Hong Kong's largest garment manufacturers with annual revenues of over 1.2 billion US dollars. Henry's business career began here on this island where he started by distributing Chinese Kung Fu movies in the 1970s. Today, the family-run business is one of the largest private conglomerates in Guam and Micronesia spanning several industries including shipping, transportation, fishing, insurance and hotels. Guam is located in the western Pacific Ocean, about four and a half hours flight from Hong Kong. Geographically, Guam is one of thousands of small islands that make up Micronesia. But politically, Guam, Saipan and the Northern Marianas are territories of the United States. While Henry's brother-in-law, George, oversees the Guam and Micronesia side of the family empire on a day-to-day -day basis, I discuss with Henry the challenges of balancing all of these interests while also running the apparel business in Hong Kong. Well, basically, I mean, you get financial KPIs and uh, budgets that uh, the, the management team that work under George will have to meet. And by and large, I think they are doing a good job and an area that we have problems, so we need to address it. I think that's part of business. You always have issues, and then you just have to address those issues. But by and large, this is a very, very small community, so you do not have a lot, a lot of organic growth in the business, but yet it's also very, very stable. You don't, don't go crazy overnight. And of course, you have history here, because when you first came to Guam, you first stayed at this particular yeah. hotel. In fact, no, uh, this hotel was the Daichi Hotel. Uh, May 72, when I first come, this is the hotel that, uh, that I stayed my, my first evening in Guam. And then you ended up purchasing it? Yeah, what a coincidence. But what are the challenges of running such a big hotel? Labor. Labor is probably one. Guam has a very limited number of people living here on the island. So to find people willing to work in the hospitality industry, the hourly labor cost is also not inexpensive. It's, um, and there's always pressure uh, from the general populace to pressure our government leaders to raise, uh, raise wages. Is it fun running a tourism business like a hotel? Do you f have fun doing it compared to all the businesses that you run? Well, actually, I mean, it's a fun business and uh, we're always trying to figure out know, how can we make the hotel itself more fun. It's a fun business in terms of return. It's probably not one of our better businesses, but uh, I have a beautiful office, so that tells you how much fun it is to be actually working out of a hotel. With this view as well. That's right. You've done business here for a long time together. There must be some fun stories to tell. Just flying. Flying to and from, from these islands is exciting. We have now coded it. We, on these, how hard these airplanes land. When the plane is landing in bad weather, they kind of have to do an aircraft carrier landing and it's like three wheels drop straight down. And we give it a, like how many oxygen masks falls down during landing. And then it was like, that was a five oxygen mask landing. That was a 10 oxygen mask landing. We had one landing where it wasn't just the oxygen mask that fell, fell down from the cover. The entire ceiling panel on the airplane dropped. We take a short trip down memory lane, just 15 minutes away from the hotel to the University of Guam. Henry has both a bachelor's and master's degree from the university, 
and in 2013 was awarded an honorary doctorate for his contributions to Guam. So Henry, does it fill you full of memories coming back here? Yeah, this is where I go to school and uh, student center here. This is where I met my wife, I mean, on her first day coming to the school. On the first day? Yeah, she wow. come here to study and she do registration. And I find out that, you know, a good looking Chinese lady behind me <laughs> has all the forms done, but don't have the stickers. I asked her, are you Chinese? I said, no, you need the stickers. Look at the stickers. So I take it around, so I said, come back to the night. I take her to every single building here, put stickers on. And since then, I know her dating, and just like everybody else, I'm getting married, happily settled down. And you have four children, and how many grandchildren? I got four kids and five grandchildren. That's an incredible story. You met your wife here on the first day. Uh, yeah. You got three degrees from this university. That's right. And you've done very well in business here. So Guam has really been kind to you. I'm very pleased to be on Guam, and Guam has treated me very well. In turn, Henry and the family have made substantial donations to the university over the years, including an English center and a library building. The university means a lot to, to me and our family. I mean, uh, of the six brothers and sisters, five of us are graduates of the University of Guam. I met my wife here, and she's also graduates of the school. And we, we like to give back to the university that educated us. The foundation is also helping exchange student programs. And I think that is important because the Chinese students, when they come to Guam, they can learn more about America. And the Guam students, when they go to China, they can also learn about the Chinese language, the culture. I think that is very important because Guam politically is part of the United States and geographically is really part of Asia. And in Asia, the economy is really Japan and, uh, and China. So I think it's good for the students here to learn more about China and I think we'll help them in the future. We're joined by Dr. Robert Underwood, current president of the university, who expands on the importance of China and Asia to the future of Guam. So how important is building that relationship with China right now as, of course, China's economy grows and its position in the world strengthens? Well, it's critically important. You know, the uh, Guam is kind of in a unique situation. We're the only U.S. accredited institution on this side of the international dateline. Uh, we exist to serve an island region, uh, but we are also very much directly affected, benefited, challenged, given opportunities by the fact that we have some very strong uh, Asian economies near us. And of course, we're politically connected to the United States. So we're trying to figure out how we can make that work for us. Rather than lamenting it, we think it's our strength. Rather than uh, thinking about uh, just fundraising, we're thinking about new generations of entrepreneurs and new generations of researchers who will understand how to make this all work for our island. One of Guam's most scenic spots is Two Lovers Point, a clifftop lookout just a few minutes from the hotel. Here, we get a spectacular view of Tumon Bay, 400 feet above the rolling waves of the Pacific Ocean. Henry, this is an incredible view. I mean, I didn't know Guam was so beautiful. I think that's what's really shocked me about this trip. Guam is beautiful. But when you're outside of Guam, you don't think of coming here necessarily. You probably go to the Maldives, or at least I would think of Maldives, Bali, and Thailand first. Why hasn't Guam captured the imagination of the Asian tourist market? We didn't advertise it enough in Hong Kong. Guam traditionally has been for Japanese. And I think hopefully after this show, we have a lot of people from Hong Kong. <laughs> so we're promoting Guam. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. How many tourists come here every year? 1.2, 1.3 million people. So we do have a sizable Japanese and Korean coming. Okay. We just need to promote Hong Kong. Time for some R&R. &R. Guam style. One of Henry's preferred pastimes is scuba diving, so we head out to a reef called Turtle Bay, just a few minutes offshore. What's your favorite part? Favorite part? Yeah. See a mermaid. We're gonna see a mermaid today, right? Yeah. A Guamanian. The water is incredibly clear and the marine life richly colored, but unfortunately, we don't see any turtles today. 
It's great just hanging out and swimming around with a tycoon. Henry, you came here 43 years ago and this island's been good to you. You consider it your second home almost. Yeah, you know, I met my wife here, Mary here, two of my kids are born here. Yeah, really good. Do you think you'll retire here one day? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, we'll, between Hong Kong, Guam and the islands. And you've had a fairly amazing career. Mm -hmm. You've seen the growth of the business, you've acquired many different businesses. What's been the most fun thing about all of that? I think to be able to have a lot of friends here and uh, it's very relaxing here. And to you, what's the definition of success? And do you think that you've been successful by your own definition? I think I'm very successful. I mean, I think you measure it the way you think it satisfies you. Mm. And I think, you no, know, I mean, I'm very happy with what I have in the last uh, 40, 50 years. While he'll readily admit luck has played a part, Henry Tang clearly has a natural ability to seize opportunities and build on them through perseverance and hard work. In Hong Kong, he's carried forward his father's legacy, creating one of the territory's largest, most profitable apparel manufacturers. The company's innovative approach to family business has ensured that it can grow and diversify while retaining talent and avoiding the internecine splits that characterize so many other family-run empires. Henry has also worked hard to ensure that his father's core values remain intact for generations to come. The combination of hard work, family values and a Pacific Island charm have given Henry Tan both success and happiness.